So welcome everyone. My name is Farid Dan Mary. I'm the executive officer of the South Asia Institute. Today we are proud to be hosting the book launch of Flying Blind, India's Quest for Global Leadership by Mohammed Zishan, a foreign affairs columnist and also the editor-in-chief of Freedom Gazette. He has previously worked with the Indian delegation to the United Nations in New York with Kearney, the global consulting, the global consulting firm. As a consultant, Zishan has advised governments across the Middle East on, uh, on the economic and political modernization and helped a multilateral declaration on cybersecurity at the 2020 G20 summit in Riyadh. He was also involved in strategizing India's historic election to the International Court of Justice in 2017. Zishan is currently a staff writer for The Diplomat and hosts a monthly Sunday column in the Deccan Herald titled The Z Factor. He has also written for The Washington Post, The Economist, The Telegraph, The Strait Times, The Sydney Morning Herald, The South China Morning Post, among other international dailies. Zishan holds a master's degree in international affairs from Columbia University, where he edited the online edition of the Columbia Journal of International Affairs. Flying Blind, India's Quest for Global Leadership takes an honest look at the performance of Indians foreign policy in terms of meeting the dreams and aspirations of a very globalized and young country. It deals with the key strategic questions facing Indian foreign policy in a multipolar world, including opportunities and threats. It also critically examines the traditional practice of foreign policy in India over the past many decades in terms of making India relevant and influential in world affairs. Finally, it identifies India's unexplored niche in global governance in the context of the world's biggest international security challenges. I would like to ask our attendees, if you have any questions for Mohammed Zishan, please can you put them in the Q&A section and then we'll, we'll explore them at the end of today's session. I would like to welcome Mohammed Zishan. Thank you, Farida. Thank you so much for having me here. It's, uh, it's an absolute pleasure and honor uh, to talk about my book uh, and uh, about India's foreign policy at a, at a very interesting time of, of India's foreign policy uh, historical practice, uh, given that India is currently a, a non-permanent member of the Security Council uh, elected to serve a, a two-year term. Uh, and uh, it has been a very, very hectic and eventful two-year term so far, to say the least, starting with the crisis in Afghanistan, and then, of course, uh, you know, the ongoing war in, in Ukraine uh, and the pandemic behind everything else. Uh, and so I think that in, in, in many ways, this is an interesting time to talk about India's foreign policy, because very rarely has India's foreign policy been put under the spotlight, either in, in India's domestic discourse or, or in global discourse, but in the last few days, it's been very interesting to me. And to be honest, I've been a bit surprised as well to see the amount of debate and, and discussion that's been out there in the international media uh, about India's foreign policy and India's abstentions in the UN Security Council. Uh, and why is India not supporting its allies in the West? You know, why is it uh, vote, you know, not voting against uh, uh, a uh, very clear cut uh, case of unilateral aggression in, in Europe, what's going on and all of that. You know, this is very new, I think, uh, to India. In some ways, India always wanted to have the global spotlight on its foreign policy. Uh, but now that it's shining bright on India's foreign policy, uh, people in, in New Delhi have become somewhat rather uncomfortable with it, uh, to say the least. And so why is this happening? You know, why is it that India, in some sense, um, has, to the rest of the world at least, been punching below its weight. And, and in my book, I write about several stats and, and facts uh, to make the case for the argument that India is punching below its weight. India is, of course, a country full of aspiration and ambition uh, on the world stage. It has been for a number of years now. The, you know, the current prime minister, Mr. Narendra Modi, tends to talk about India as a Jagat Guru, which in Sanskrit and Hindi means a leader of the world or, or a world guru. Uh, and yet at the same time, India has traditionally been very insular in its outlook to the world. In, in the opening pages of my book, 
uh, in the preface of the book, I talk about a comparison between, you know, Indian newspapers and foreign newspapers, particularly Western ones. And if you compare the amount of, uh, you know, non-Indian news in an Indian newspaper, you'd find about half a page, one page at most, maybe a page and a half during a crisis like the one in Ukraine, uh, very rarely beyond that. But if you open the New York Times or the Washington Post or the Wall Street Journal, you'll find pages and pages of non-US news, uh, you know, uh, about all parts of the world, not just the West, not just Europe, but also Africa, uh, Asia, parts of Asia that most people in Asia don't think about, uh, and, and so on. But in India, you don't find this to be the case. And so as a result, what has happened is that in 2018, there was a very interesting survey conducted by Pew, uh, I believe that there is a, a more recent survey that has been conducted by Pew, but I, I believe that the results are not out yet. But in this survey in 2018, Pew asked re respondents in, I think, 27 countries. The question was, is India today as important, more important, or less important in world affairs compared to 10 years ago? And in only one country did more than half the respondents say that India is now more important, and that country was India. And what was more frustrating about that survey, I think at least to a, an Indian foreign policy analyst, was that the countries that were more skeptical about India, or the countries where more people said that India was actually less important now, were people in developing countries like Brazil and South Africa and Indonesia and the Philippines and so on. Now this, to my mind, should have been a bigger news story in India, but as far as I can remember in 2018, really nobody in, in, you know, in the Indian media talked about this or debated it on primetime television or anything else. Uh, and that was very surprising because you know, this was a very unique survey undertaken on the world stage, internationally speaking about India's stature as, as an emerging power. And we do talk all the time about India being a leader of the developing world. And yet the result was that in the developing world, most people or many people felt that India was not really playing the kind of role that they saw India play 10 years prior, which was in 2008. So why was this really happening? And this, I think the survey was kind of a starting point or a trigger point, if you will, uh, to my research and study into uh, India's quest for global leadership which culminated uh, in my book, Flying Blind. I had been an Indian abroad for uh, a number of years uh, you know, prior to that. I was actually born Indian abroad uh, and then studied as an Indian abroad. And, I was, and, and then of course I, I worked for a bit abroad uh, as an Indian. And I was very struck by the fact that an Indian passport holder was not given really the same amount of travel freedom and opportunities that existed uh, to an Australian citizen or, or an American citizen or a German citizen. And in fact, if you pull up the passport index, which is uh, compiled by Henley and partners over the last several years, you'll find that India is ranked uh, abysmally low year after year uh, on, on the passport index, which measures travel freedom, which is the number of countries that you know, a, a citizen of your country can go to without requiring a visa uh, or at best uh, an electronic visa. And on this index, India tends to rank amidst, um, you know, well below the likes of uh, China or Mexico, or Brazil or South Africa, other developing countries around the world. Uh, and it ranks alongside countries such as Mongolia and Turkmenistan and Sierra Leone uh, and others. And I think, you know, the, uh, the year that I wrote my, uh, my book uh, in, in late 2020, uh, India was ranked below Sierra Leone uh, on, on the passport index which to most people would be quite shocking. And then you would find new stories of Indians being trapped around the world, most uh, recently in Ukraine, where there were, I think, about 20,000 odd Indian students studying medicine and other such courses in Ukraine. And India had to pull out all stops to evacuate them after the war had begun. And this is a terribly you know, a recurrent story and frequent story in Indian foreign policy. You saw this happen in Yemen. You saw this happen in Libya as well. There are Indians all around the world. And yet when, you know, conflict or crisis uh, strikes that part of the world, uh, India's government tends to not have much of a voice uh, in, in what goes on. And Indian people end up paying the price. So from an Indian's point of view, I think the question really was, why is it that India, despite its uh, aspirations for global leadership is not really able to uh, 
um, uh, you know, measure up. And I think to the rest of the world, the question in my mind was what exactly does India's rise really mean? Uh, which is a question now that a lot of people in, in the international media are asking, given that the Ukraine crisis is going on and India is in the Security Council, why is India not voting for the West? Why is India afraid to take a stance? And India tends not to take a stance on most issues. There is no Indian policy on Yemen, for instance. Uh, there is no Indian policy on the civil war in Ethiopia. There is no Indian policy on the civil war in Venezuela, where there have been two competing presidents for uh, a number of years now. Uh, and of course, on Taiwan and other sensitive political matters, India, again, tends to be uh, well away and, and, and at best uh, tends to sit on the fence. Uh, for reasons that are not well articulated in Indian foreign policy. So the rest of the world tends to ask, what are India's interests? What is India going to do if India becomes a global superpower tomorrow, uh, which uh, in the eyes of many uh, seems to be uh, a logical conclusion to, to India's uh, foreign policy, given that India is a very large country and a country uh, significantly located in, in the Asia Pacific, uh, with a very, very young population, uh, which is very likely to make up a significant chunk of uh, the global workforce uh, in the years to come. But when India started out as, a, as an independent country, as, as I chart out the history of India's foreign policy in my book, I talk about the fact that India's first prime minister, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, actually did have a, a foreign policy uh, of purpose. And his foreign policy was that India is born out of a, an anti-colonial movement for independence, uh, fighting for freedom and, and self-determination and human rights, standing up against colonial exploitation and racism around the world and all of that. And this purpose of the Indian freedom movement was then borrowed or translated into India's foreign policy uh, by Prime Minister Nehru. And India took a very vocal, a uh, very strong uh, activist stance uh, in several uh, conflict-ridden parts of the world, including in the Congo, in, in, uh, in the Indochina, in Korea, and so on. Countries where there was, I think, in, in the Indian uh, 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 viewpoint, at least, uh, a struggle between local uh, freedom fighters and Western exploitation, as, as Indians saw it at the time. And so India gave its support, for instance, to the Congolese government when it was fighting against uh, rebels in the East that were backed by the West uh, in, during the Cold War. And similarly, India tended to give its support for the, you know, the uh, uh, Vietnamese fighters uh, as well, uh, not military support, but, but at least moral support. And India tended to take a stance on, on Palestine, for instance, where India felt that there was a case for the rights of, of self-determination for the Palestinian people. Uh, and so during the Cold War, or for most part of the Cold War, at least under Prime Minister Nehru, India tended to take a stand on uh, political disputes all around the world. Uh, and it was consistent in its principle. And its principle was that we are going to stand up for self-determination. We are going to stand up for people who are fighting against colonialism uh, and against uh, quote unquote Western exploitation and so on. That was in some sense, I think, derailed with the war with China in 1962, uh, where India uh, suffered uh, tremendous losses and, and casualties. Of course, in the end, China kind of withdrew, uh, you know, once winter uh, set on. Uh, for several reasons that continue to be debated to this day, why China withdrew. Uh, but that defeat to China uh, in the military conflict of 1962, in some sense, I think, uh, left a dent in India's strategic thinking uh, in Delhi, where people start to believe that India had kind of overshot its, its material capabilities. India was, of course, at that point in time, a very poor country, uh, heavily dependent on uh, countries around the world for food aid and, and other things. Uh, famines were still a part of India's daily life uh, in the 1960s and, and 50s. Um, and its military had been woefully exposed and brutally exposed by uh, the Chinese uh, PLA uh, in 1962. And so India started to turn inward starting from there on. And then, you know, of course, Prime Minister Nehru himself expired in 1964. And the prime ministers who followed him, particularly his daughter Indira Gandhi, decided that she was going to take a very neighborhood-centric foreign policy stand. Uh, she would not take a political stand on what's going on outside of India's neighborhood, 
because she had believed and in some sense had rightly believed uh, that India did not have the material capabilities to play a proactive role outside of South Asia. So India played a very, or rather pursued a very Machiavellian uh, sort of neighborhood centric militaristic foreign policy, if you will. Uh, those were the years when India started its uh, research into nuclear weapons uh, in the 70s was the first uh, uh, Indian nuclear weapons test. Uh, and then, of course, the inevitable sanctions followed with it. India started to kind of look inward uh, increasingly, and it was a phase of nation building in some sense. Uh, the military underwent a, a lot of reform as well. There was, of course, the uh, you know the intercession of the uh, uh, emergency from 1975 to 77, which I write about in detail in my book. Um, which in some sense uh, seemed to show to the rest of the world that India's experiment with democracy had finally come to an end. Uh, but then in 1977, for reasons yet debated, uh, Prime Minister Indira Gandhi decided to remove or, or uh, you know, uh, end the emergency uh, period and then called elections in which he was merciful, uh, mercilessly defeated uh, and routed by the opposition parties. Um, and then started, in some sense, India's further soul searching on how India can actually develop its economy. Because up until the late 80s, early 90s, India's economy was still growing at best at about 2 or 3% a year on average, which for a country of that economic size uh, uh, and its population was very, very low. India's per capita income was extremely low. And so starting out from a low base, while China and Korea and Taiwan and all these other countries in East Asia were taking off, uh, India was still languishing in, in, uh, in the lower uh, 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 you know, regions of GDP growth. Uh, and so came in the early 90s, uh, forced or otherwise, uh, you know, democratically forced or otherwise, uh, the economic reform program, which opened up India's economy uh, to the rest of the world. Uh, and alongside it, India started to kind of feel its feet outside the waters of South Asia. There was a Look East program that was started in the early 90s by Prime Minister P.V. Narasimha Rao, uh, which was an outreach to Southeast Asian countries or the Asian tigers, as, as we call them, uh, that were all growing very rapidly. Uh, and so starting from the early 90s, India started to liberalize its trade. And overnight, you started seeing Japanese cars on the Indian streets, uh, American food chains uh, at every street corner. Uh, you had, of course, the, the, the very fast influx of uh, uh, American IT and software firms that started outsourcing, uh, you know, uh, 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 higher skilled jobs to uh, uh, Indian people. And so overnight, India's GDP growth started to take off uh, with these reforms. Uh, and in my book, I talk about some of the uh, stats and figures that came out of this time. In 1988, India's trade weighed about 13.5% of its GDP. Ten years later, in 1998, with all of the liberalization and reform that had taken place, India's trade had actually almost doubled to 24%. Services trade had more than doubled as a percentage of GDP. And not surprisingly, India's real GDP increased by as much as 70% in those 10 years between 1988 to 1998, uh, which were the, uh, the, the years of uh, India's economic reform. So in many ways, I think that if we look at what India's interests are, I make the case in my book uh, that India's interests started to come into shape and form during the 1990s when India's economy finally started to take off. Before the 1990s, uh, and really through most part of uh, Prime Minister Nehru's term uh, and, and you know, his daughter Indira Gandhi's term and beyond, India followed a, an import substitution uh, approach to its uh, economic growth model, uh, which did not work at all. Uh, and uh, it was, uh, quite frankly, a very insular, inward-looking economy and society up until the re liberalization reforms of the 90s. And what you saw happen with the 90s was an opening of India to the rest of the world, which also had tremendous cultural and social changes within India. And so now today you look at the number of people who speak, in, uh, who speak English in India. There are more people who speak English in India than there are people who speak English in the United States, uh, which to most people would come as a surprise. And so in India, 
in some sense has now become an English speaking power in that sense. Of course, as a percentage, uh, the English speaking population in India is still um, uh, quite small, but it is nonetheless a population, uh, a percentage of the population that is growing every year, uh, regardless of uh, you know, linguistic nationalism and, and other things. The data shows that the percentage of people in India who speak English has been growing every year and continues to grow every year quite steadily. And with that, of course, you had the influx of, you know, Western made sitcoms uh, uh, and Western movies and Western music and all of the other things that follow wherever people speak English, uh, Western food and cuisine as well. And so India became, unlike East Asia in many ways, an amalgamation, if you will, of different cultures. That's what Indian civilization has always been through the centuries. Uh, and when India opened up its economy in the early 1990s, it then invited in Western influences into its society and culture and eating habits and musical habits and, and all of these other things. Uh, and that is, I think, in many ways, what led to this convergence, if you will, between India and the United States in particular uh, in, in, in the 2000s. So what really are India's interests? In my book, I argue that India's interests are, to be honest, very Western in nature if, because of the fact that India's economy uh, is, is built on a very Western economic model. For instance, unlike the Eastern Asian economies, India's economic growth uh, you know, depends very heavily on its services sector. And so that is why you find that higher education is a very important thing for India, English education, is a very important thing for India. Uh, and so the chairman of the Indian Space Research Organization for many years was actually the son of a farmer. And so you found that while many other countries in East Asia and elsewhere were sending people from the farm to factory, Indians were actually sending farmers to the, you know, to the software firms to do programming and coding and all of these other things. Uh, and then eventually either to, you know, to Bangalore or, or country, uh, cities like that within India or to Silicon Valley straight away in California. And so India ended up with a very large diaspora. The Indian diaspora is the largest diaspora in the world. Uh, and much of the Indian diaspora ended up being very politically active and influential, especially in the democratic West. So in the West, you would find in the United States, for instance, a number of governors and, and uh, uh, you know, a number of uh, Congress uh, representatives are actually Indian origin. Uh, Kamala Harris, the vice president, is Indian origin. In New Zealand, one of the uh, major ministers, I, I'm forgetting her name now, but it is all in my book. One of the senior ministers in the New Zealand government uh, was actually, is actually of Indian origin for the first time in New Zealand's history. And actually, it, it's very interesting to note that my grandfather, or like my late grandfather, uh, knew the aunt uh, of, of, of the minister in question. And so there is a, a little bit of a personal connection there as well that I, I learned about as I did research for this book. So the Indian diaspora became very politically influential, especially in the democratic West. Now in my book, I make the argument therefore that in so far as India's interests are concerned, the fact that India's diaspora becomes politically influential and gets mobilized and more organized uh, and becomes really a tool of Indian foreign policy uh, in many democratic countries. That gives India a very, very big incentive really to stand up for democracy and human rights promotion around the world. Much bigger strategic incentive than the United States would have because wherever there is a democracy, wherever human rights uh, and freedom of expression is available, Indians in that country become politically active and influential and then become presidents and prime ministers or members of parliament and, and uh, you know, active influential politicians. And as a result, India in its own foreign policy practice has found that they are very, very useful tools of Indian foreign policy because they stand up for what they see as Indian interests. And so you found that in the United States, for instance, during the nuclear deal uh, you know, negotiations in the early 2000s, the roadblocks to the Indian uh, US nuclear deal were actually in the Indian parliament, not so much in the US Congress. And a very large part of the reason for that was because the Indian American lobby in the US Congress and around Washington DC uh, was standing up very vigorously for that nuclear deal, saying that you know, the US has to look at India as a strategic ally. 
And similarly, when Australia was thinking about removing its ban on uranium export to India, remember that when the nuclear tests had taken place in India, there were sanctions from the West uh, on India. Uh, and so Australia in, in the mid to late 2000s started to think about removing this uh, ban on uranium export to India. And at that point in time as well, again, the Indian uh, diaspora in Australia became a very useful tool for Indian foreign policy to lobby the Australian government, and then finally succeeded actually in removing that ban on uranium exports. So many of these extraordinary successes, unprecedented successes, especially in the nuclear proliferation uh, uh, you know, field that India has scored, came through the diaspora. And so in my book, I argue that the Indian diaspora gives India a very strong incentive to stand up for democracy promotion and human rights around the world. The other thing that I find uh, as a result on, on the economic side is that since globalization and trade and openness and immigration and all of these things have created economic growth, a globalized world is very much in India's interest again. And so immigration is something that Indian uh, foreign ministers across governments have really been taking up very aggressively and vocally with the US administrations uh, over the years. Uh, because of the fact that, uh, you know, many of the Indians uh, who are educated in India go and work in the US and send back billions and billions of dollars back to India in remittances, which are then, you know, uh, plowed uh, ostensibly for state building and development purposes. And so globalization as a result gives uh, India uh, a, a very huge economic interest uh, to stand up for these norms and principles uh, on the world stage. These are some of the interests that I find a democratic, liberal, secular India uh, faces uh, in, 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 the, in the world stage in global governance. Then of course, in my book, I go on to talk about the various challenges that India faces from South Asia, uh, from China, from the West and the United States in particular. What can India do to meet these opportunities and challenges uh, around the world? I'm not going to go into detail uh, into them. People who want to uh, read more about it can certainly read the book. Uh, uh, but uh, you know, certainly, I think that India today stands at a time when uh, it does have uh, a, you know, a lot of the material limitations that we found in the 50s and 60s that held back Prime Minister Nehru, uh, or finally, you know, in the eyes of many, uh, uh, led to the debacle of 1962. Many of those limitations have not gone away completely, but they are significantly lesser. And so if India does want to take a stand and play a bigger, more proactive role in, on the world stage, it certainly can do that. It has said that it wants to do that. The Indian prime minister, not just the current one, but even the previous one have, have spoken about it on the world stage uh, at length. They have waxed eloquent about the fact that India has arrived and you know, deserves to have a seat in the Security Council and all the decision-making councils of the world, all that is left to do for India now is to say, okay, if we want to be in the Security Council, which we now are for two years, what are we going to do with that seat? What are we going to show the world uh, about India's rise? What are we going to show the world about an Indian world order? What can we stand up for? And what kind of action are we going to take? That is the challenge that now exists before the Narendra Modi government uh, you know, uh, in its uh, in its quest for global leadership, in India's quest for global leadership, and we will wait and see uh, where these coming years take us. Uh, and so, with that, Farida, I, I would like to stop my very long-winded lecture <laughs> uh, and and allow the floor to be given to uh, uh, question and answers, uh, including your own, uh, and and we can take it forward. I hope. Fantastic. I'd like to share a few questions with you before we explore the questions from the floor. So, Mohammed, why do you say that India's foreign policy has underperformed for a country of its size and significance? That's a that's a good question that I think is not debated and discussed enough, uh, you know, in, in India today. Uh, one reason, as, as I pointed out uh, early in my in my talk, was that Pew survey that came up in, in 2018, uh, which as I said, found that many people around the world were extremely skeptical about whether India uh, was playing an important role. Remember, the question that was asked in that survey is very, very significant. The question was not, is India now a world power? The question was, 
is India now more important or as important or less important compared to 10 years ago? So it was relative to India's own performance uh, in many ways. And the survey result threw up that people thought that India was actually underperforming relative to its own performance in 2008. And so that I think in many ways to my mind was extremely alarming. The fact that relative to its own underperformance as some people would put it uh, 10 years prior in 2008, India was actually underperforming even further. Uh, and so now that to my mind, uh, you know, leads to one of two possibilities. One is that India was truly underperforming on an objective level compared to 2008, or it was that the rest of the world kind of had very high expectations for what India would do in 2018. And relative to those expectations, India was actually under delivering. I think that, that it, it is very fair to say that the second uh, uh, you know, possibility uh, uh, is, is a fair assessment as well. Because if you look at India today, India is a nuclear power state. Uh, India does have the second largest population in the world for better or worse, you, know, you can say it's a demographic disaster or a demographic dividend. But the fact of the matter is that the fact that a very large proportion of the world's future workforce resides in India, means that if India flies, then it pulls the rest of the world along with it. But if India sinks, the rest of the world also sinks along with it. And I think this is very important, especially in the context of China's own aging problems and you know, slowdown problems. China has got debt troubles. Uh, China's economy has been slowing down for a number of years now. It's trying to restructure itself. Its population is aging. All of these things exist. And so for the last four decades, the global economy has grown because of China in, in many ways. But for the next four decades, that's not going to be the case. China is not going to be able to power uh, really global economic growth in the same way. We already see the uh, blowback of this in many ways in especially commodity exporting countries like Venezuela or Brazil uh, or Chile uh, in Latin America, uh, African countries like South Africa and others. Many of these countries that were exporting uh, minerals and commodities to China uh, for most part of the early 2000s uh, and the 1990s, they have started to suffer tremendous uh, uh, you know, economic uh, strains because demand for these commodities in China has actually fallen in the last many years uh, as a result of its restructuring uh, of the domestic economy uh, and its uh, quite rapid aging as well. The same thing happened in the 80s, uh, in the 90s when Japan was aging and, and slowing as well. And so now we're seeing a repeat of that with China. When Japan aged and slowed, China picked up the slack. Now that China is aging and slowing, the only country really large enough to pick up the slack is India. And so if India is not going to prosper, then that is going to be a massive problem for the rest of the world. Uh, and so I think from that angle as well, it's very fair for the rest of the world to say that we had expectations of India. India is not meeting that as yet. So what would you say are the key challenges holding back India's rise as a world power? Well, I think that, you know, despite the fact that India is a nuclear powered state and, um, uh, you know, has a young population and all of that, the line between demographic dividend and demographic disaster is thinning uh, at the moment. And so, you know, with COVID-19, that's gotten much worse. Millions of people who are going to school are now, come, you know, out of school. They've been out of school for the last year and a half or two years. Uh, and so, the gains that India had made in terms of developing its youth and you know, making them uh, employable and all of that, that is now starting to suffer, uh, already was suffering before the pandemic hit, but now with the pandemic, it is suffering even more. There's one excellent book that I'd like to recommend on this written by Akar Patel, uh, which is provocatively titled Price of the Modi Years, uh, but uh, you know, uh, it, it, it does capture India's performance on several global indices uh, in the last, uh, I think, seven or eight years. Uh, and it shows across several socioeconomic indicators and so on how India has performed in the last seven to eight years uh, with uh, raw data that has been collected painstakingly by researchers across India and around the world. Uh, and it does paint a very bleak picture for uh, the uh, you know, socioeconomic development that, that India has been trying to undertake for the last uh, uh, 30 years, uh, if you will. 
uh, to create a demographic dividend out of its uh, out of its young population. So that's a massive uh, you know pullback. I think the the other challenge really is that India is uh, you know a large fuel importer as well as a large arms importer, <laughs> and that's never a very good combination to have together. Uh, if you look at the United States, for instance. It's always been very arm sufficient, uh, but it was energy dependent on the Middle East. But the fact that it was militarily powerful or militarily present uh, meant that in many ways it got a good deal from the Middle East on its oil import. Uh, but now that, uh, uh, you know, in the last few years, it has even managed to get rid of the energy dependence with becoming energy independent and now is, is actually one of the uh, net exporters of, uh, of energy in the world. Uh, and I think very soon it will become one of the uh, largest ex exporters of oil and natural gas in the world, thanks to the shale oil revolution. So this is a problem that India has been trying to fix. It does have some uh, mineral resources in the Northeast uh, and in the West and so on, but the Northeast and, and Central India are extremely restive, unstable regions. And so mining of these mineral resources has been uh, you know, uh, stunted really for the last several years, and it has impacted India's ability to become more energy sufficient or, or energy self-sufficient. And then of course, arms imports are a, are a major factor. Uh, people would be wondering, and they've been discussing why India has not been criticizing Russia for Ukraine. And a large part of the reason for that is because more than half of India's military inventory comes from Russia. Uh, and so even though India has been trying to diversify away from Russia, uh, you know, Russia tends to still hold a very large stake in the Indian arms market. Although that argument can cut both ways, because as I write in my book as well, India is the largest arms importer in the world. Uh, and so, you know, countries like Israel and Russia and others that are dependent on arms and exports to India and countries like India, um, you know, would also be dependent on Indian foreign policy uh, for their own welfare. And so if India is angry with Russia, and India decides that it's not going to import as many arms from Russia, that's going to hurt Russia just as much as people would think it would hurt India uh, and India's national security as well, particularly at a time when sanctions are uh, abundant on, on the Russian economy uh, from the West uh, and, and continue to grow. The third, I think, very dire challenge, uh, really, I would say that's facing India today is that a lot of its strengths are getting watered down. In my book, I talk about what India's strengths are as, as an emerging power. India's strength really is that it is a, it's a liberal secular democracy in the post-colonial world with a very large diverse population. And that is unheard of. If you look at countries in Africa, for instance, there have been about 200 odd civil wars for the last 50 years uh, since uh, Africa became independent. Latin America similarly has suffered revolutions and coups and, and, and uh, you know, rebellions and civil wars of different kinds over the years. Uh, many parts of Asia have suffered that as well. Indochina has suffered it in, in very large part. Pakistan has suffered it in, in very large part. But India has stood out as a beacon of hope in many ways for the post-colonial world, saying that, okay, here is a country that is poor, that suffers developmental challenges, that has a very large population, which is very diverse with a huge you know, religious minority and all of that stuff. And yet for the last 70, 75 years has managed to make democracy work and constitutional democracy work. So in many ways, India's constitutional liberal secular democracy was uh, you know, a very large part of the Indian uh, growth model uh, and a very large part of India's soft power. When I talk about India's diaspora being a foreign policy tool, India's constitutional democracy is a very big part of that story. If India was not a constitutional democracy that took care of its diversity, uh, you know, that, that was free of uh, the kind of instability that has plagued other countries around the world, the Indian diaspora would not have been uh, as efficient and effective a, a foreign policy tool for the Indian government as it has been. I make that argument in comparison to China in particular. I mean, China has got a diaspora around the world. The Philippines has got a large diaspora around the world, but China is probably uh, a better reference point because China is a very large country. Uh, but the Chinese diaspora has not been as fond of the Chinese Communist Party as the Indian diaspora has been fond of Indian democracy for the last many years. Uh, and so 
the reason for that is that the Chinese government, uh, you know, with Tiananmen Square and all of these other uh, controversial developments, sort of built a, a moat between itself and, and the Chinese diaspora in the 80s and 90s uh, and early 2000s. That's now starting to change slowly, uh, but then that's a different story for why the Chinese diaspora is now becoming better uh, glued into uh, you know, the, uh, the Chinese government. But the fact still remains that you can think about a Kamala Harris or a Bobby Jindal in America making the case for stronger ties with India. You can never think about a Chinese American politician in the United States making that kind of an argument. Uh, not just because China and the United States are you know, on, this, on this geopolitical clash, but also because a Chinese American politician in the United States would not be as uh, uh, you know, a fond of uh, uh, China's one party state as an American in, uh, Indian American politician would be fond of Indian democracy. So democracy is a very, very large part of India's soft power. But in the last couple of years in particular, you can find that this is being diluted. India is in many ways uh, no longer really, in my opinion, the kind of de democracy that it used to be. Uh, it is today, for all practical purposes, a majoritarian democracy. State institutions across the Indian democratic setup uh, are suffering for their independence uh, and struggling for their independence. They're suffering uh, under uh, uh, you know, the uh, political uh, push uh, of uh, majoritarianism. Uh, and, and these conflicts that are emerging in India are very, very significant, uh, not just for India's stability and India's uh, growth as, as a global power, but also for the stability and security, I think, for the rest of the world. Because remember, this is a country where you've got hundreds of millions of people who belong to minority communities. Uh, it is unparalleled and unheard of anywhere else in the world. You will never find any country in the world that has a minority community the size of Brazil uh, in, in its population and, uh, and numbers. And so I think that in many ways, this is a very large challenge for India and for the world. Thank you, Mohammed. Now we'll take some questions from the floor. Uh, Sophie has a question for you. As a tech professional working for an, in, for an Indian um, integrator, I've been surprised by how many consular barriers there are still for foreigners to enter the country for business. Do you see this disconnect between the outward looking business sector and a more inward looking government beginning to improve? And do you see any political parties offering any differentiation between themselves on this topic? That's a really good point. Uh, and I have to agree with Sophie that this is definitely a, a dichotomy. You know, you can even call it hypocrisy in many ways because Indian governments uh, across uh, the political spectrum have traditionally gone to the United States, have gone to the, to the European Union, and they've said, you know, you've got to loosen your uh, visa laws, you've got to loosen your trade laws and all of that, allow our people to come in and work in your countries. But India is unwilling to do the same thing. India kind of wants to have a one-sided deal, really, uh, with the West, where the West opens up to, to Indians, but India will not open up to Western uh, businesses and working professionals uh, just as much. Uh, one argument that is made, I think, uh, on this point is the fact that India has a very large population. Uh, it's much more densely packed in population than, say, the United States or uh, many parts of Western Europe. Uh, and so as a result, India says, you know, America can afford to take in a few million people. India cannot afford to take in so many people. It's not an argument I would completely agree with, but it is an argument that's made within Indian politics uh, if this issue comes up at all. Uh, but unfortunately, I do have to say that this issue does not come up at all in Indian political discourse. It's not a point that people have taken up. And I think it is a point that people should take up because, you know, as I pointed out, Globalization was a very big reason for India's economic transformation starting in the early 90s. Uh, and, and a large part of that was also, you know, this kind of, uh, 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 you know, exchange and, and interaction with the West and not just the West, but also the rest of the world. And so you do want to have, I think, more people coming in from the rest of the world to India to do business, bringing in their investment. Uh, also studying and, you know, adding to the knowledge repository that exists in Indian universities. I can say from experience, for instance, I studied at Columbia, and when you, I've studied in India, in an Indian university as well as in the West. And when you compare 
the uh, you know uh, learning experience between Indian, Indian University and a Western University, I for one um, you know gained tremendously, and I write about this in my book as well. I gained tremendously from the fact that I was at Columbia with Mexicans and Colombians and South Africans, uh, and uh, you know of course Indians and Americans and, and 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 Australians and others, because these people brought in viewpoints and perspectives from around the world that I as an Indian had not been exposed to. Uh, before I went uh, to Colombia. But if you go to an Indian university, you will find, of course, the diversity of India within it, but you will not find the diversity of the world within it. I think there is a, a statistic that came out a few years ago that said that something like only 5% of professors at Indian universities come from outside of India. And that's a very unfortunate statistic. I think you've got to try and build in more diversity and perspective uh, diversity of perspectives and cultures into your education system. Uh, that's the only real way, I think, to kind of uh, inculcate or, or build a more innovative uh, research culture in, uh, uh, in your education system. And I think the same argument can certainly be made for the business sector as well. Thank you. We have a question from Radharaja. Your comment on Indian's foreign policy on its southern neighbor, Sri Lanka, would be interesting to hear. Historic times to where it is now. Yeah, that's that's something that I do write about in my book. Uh, I write about it in my book in the context of how open South Asia used to be and how close South Asia has become today. Uh, and so Sri Lanka is a very interesting example of that because if you look at Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka is an extraordinarily diverse country for, you know, a country that's at the far flung corner of South Asia and, you know, an island nation that's pretty much uh, surrounded by water on all its sides. I mean, uh, the only land link, if you will, uh, to, uh, to Sri Lanka is through southern India. Uh, and, and that also from Tamil Nadu. So, you know, the only way to feed Sri Lanka, if you're thinking about it geographically, uh, is uh, is by sending Tamils into, into Sri Lanka. But if you look at the way that the Sri Lankan population has developed over the centuries, you will find that it's actually genetically very diverse. You have, of course, a very large Tamil population in the north. But what's interesting about the Sinhalese is that the Sinhalese have got genetic and historical and cultural linkages to North India. Uh, and so what happened in Sri Lanka, according to history and part of it legend and part of it recorded history, uh, is that there was a prince who came from Eastern India uh, in Bengal, uh, migrated down to, to Sri Lanka, I think uh, before, before Christ, I don't remember. I think it was second century BC. Uh, and I write about his story in, in my book. And along with this prince, he, he was called Prince Vijaya. He, you know, a number of Indians started to migrate down to Sri Lanka as well. And then, of course, through the centuries, there were Austro nations and other tribal people who also came to Sri Lanka by sea. Uh, there were Tamilians who, or Dravidians who came down from South, uh, South India uh, in, into Sri Lanka. And so you've got Sri Lanka being this hodgepodge country over centuries because of how open uh, and outward looking it was and South Asia as a whole was. Uh, uh, you know, with this, with this huge cultural and linguistic and uh, over, over time also religious diversity. But you look at what's happening today between India and Sri Lanka. For the last many, many years, India and Sri Lanka have been trying to sign this economic partnership agreement. It has been negotiated and then, you know, sent to parliament uh, and then, you know, brought back to the negotiating table because it had to be watered down. There was a lot of protest. There's a lot of opposition within Sri Lanka uh, to an economic partnership agreement with India. Protectionists were saying, what are you doing? You know, the Indian service sector is going to come in. The barbers will come in. The workers will come in. The software engineers and plumbers will come in. They're going to swarm in and take over Sri Lanka, all of this kind of stuff. And so it was watered down and watered down. And to this day, it continues to be negotiated between India and Sri Lanka. Every year, the Sri Lankan prime minister says, next year, we're going to get it signed. Uh, and it does not get signed. And then the next year it says, the next year we will get it signed. It still does not get signed. They continue to negotiate. And a very large part of this, I, I, I argue in my book, is because there is a, a culture of mistrust really between not just India and Sri Lanka. In fact, India and Sri Lanka in many ways uh, is, is a slightly rosier story, 
but between India and every other neighbor in its uh, in 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 the South Asian uh, uh, region, there is a culture of mistrust that is built up over a period of time for several reasons, both strategic and cultural and historical and so on. I'm not just talking about India and Pakistan, but as I said, also India and Sri Lanka, India and Bangladesh, India and Nepal, and 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 so on. Uh, and so it's it's very unfortunate to see that Sri Lanka, this country that had actually been built by migrants, if you will, who came from the Indian mainland, uh, is today in some ways uh, now a country with whom India is unable to sign an economic partnership agreement of a very basic nature. Thank you. We have a question from Sri. As you mentioned, India's interests align with, West, with the West. India is still, is see, still seen bandwagoning USA. Unlike China, we succumb to US sanctions on Iran, Venezuela, or Russia when it comes to buy oil, compromising with national economic interests. How long do you think it will take India to adopt an independent foreign policy, pursuing its core interests boldly? Well, that's an interesting question because you know the, the phrase that's thrown about a lot in New Delhi is strategic autonomy or non-alignment, you know, which, which talks about. Uh, the idea that India is an independent country, it's for, you know, following an independent foreign policy. In fact, when India abstained on Ukraine, one of the big reasons or arguments that, that was made in, in New Delhi was that, oh, you know, strategic autonomy, we are not going to be bulldozed by the West and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, on the sanctions bit, I think that's a little bit difficult because, you know, if there are sanctions on a country, even China is kind of going to think twice before doing open business. They do, of course, buy oil from Iran and Venezuela, but a lot of that is kind of uh, black market oil, if you will. It's brought in through underground means. It's uh, colored in, in different ways. It's sent in through Oman or Malaysia, and then it is imported into China as Malaysian oil or Omani oil rather than as Iranian and, and Venezuelan oil. So China as well, kind of including on, on the issue of Russia, I think we will see, China will be kind of walking around eggshells because it does not want to attract sanctions from the West uh, itself. And so India in many ways will follow whatever sanctions are put uh, by the West on Russia and these other countries because India does not want to suffer. Uh, but at the same time, you'll find that the US has kind of given India a long rope. I mean, uh, on Iran, for instance, there, ha there has been in the past, uh, including under the Donald Trump administration, there have been uh, exceptions and waivers uh, uh, for India. Uh, on Russia, similarly, India has gotten waivers on, on sanctions uh, since the Crimea episode as well. Every time India wants uh, a big shiny uh, you know, piece of weapon from Russia, India goes to Washington and Washington says, all right, you can, you can have it. Uh, I think that, that rope is kind of fraying now and Washington is starting to lose its patience. But so far, America has been saying that India is an important partner, so let India do whatever it wants to do. Now, the question I think for India is, what are its interests? And so, you know, uh, India has not, I think, defined as yet what its interests are. On Iran, for instance, it's not clear, you know, from India's point of view, whether India wants to say that we want to have sanctions on Iran, let's bring Iran back to the negotiating table, uh, or let's go hard on Iran. There's no policy really from India on what should be done about Iran, whether India, whether Iran deserves a nuclear weapon or not. Now, what's interesting about this is that India is not a signatory to the NPT, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, uh, because I, I write about this in my book. India believes that uh, you know the NPT is a, is a discriminatory treaty. It's a reasonable stand. Uh, India says that. Uh, uh, if five countries can have nuclear weapons, everybody should be allowed to have nuclear weapons uh, or, you know, just let nobody have nuclear weapons at all. And India has said that India is willing to give up nuclear weapons uh, if everybody else in the world gives up nuclear weapons as well. And so if you look at it from that standpoint, from a principle standpoint, I would say that India is right in believing that the NPT is uh, discriminatory. And so if India can have nuclear weapons and doesn't sign on to the NPT, why can't Iran have nuclear weapons? Why should Iran uh, have to you know, forego its nuclear weapons? Uh, and if you, if you talk about it from a principle point of view, then India's interest is let Iran have nuclear weapons. Except of course, that India has not made its stand clear at all on, on this issue. So if India wants to say that Iran should not have nuclear weapons, that India should talk about why it thinks that uh, uh, Iran should not have nuclear weapons, while it can have nuclear weapons itself. 
But again, India has not, uh, you know, articulated any clear policy. It sits on the fence. It doesn't want to take a stand. It's not clear. And as a result, I think what you're seeing, uh, uh, and, and that's where uh, I think this question hits the nail on the head, is that on the West side, India is not being a good ally. And to India, the West is not being a good ally because the West is asking India to do things that India doesn't want to do. Uh, and so, uh, it, you know, in many ways, this is, a, this is a product of not having a clear foreign policy outlook. We have a question from Roshana regarding personnel capacity in India. What are the reasons for the low numbers of Indian civil servants and what solutions long term, short term can help? Yeah, this is another question that I tackle both early in my book as well as late in my book, because, you know, if you look at the Indian Foreign Service, it has as many diplomats as Singapore does, which is ridiculous because Singapore is, is a third or a fourth of, uh, uh, you know, the size of New Delhi. Uh, and so India's small foreign service has in many ways uh, kind of uh, left its dent on Indian foreign policy and on India's quest for global leadership because you find that you've got one diplomat doing way too many things and they don't really have the bandwidth to do, you know, kind of uh, uh, do the kind of strategic thinking and planning that's required for India's foreign policy, uh, particularly at a time when there are crises around the world, uh, India needs to start taking a stand. But the groundwork is not being done because India simply doesn't have any diplomats on the ground to do that groundwork and to understand, okay, you know, in Iran or in Ukraine, this is what India needs to do because this is what in uh, Iranian or Ukrainian civil society thinks. This is what the government thinks, this is what the people think. That sort of ground research and intelligence work is really not being done to the level that it should be done because India simply doesn't have enough people on the ground. Now, the reasons for this are, honestly speaking, uh, quite bizarre. One reason that's put out uh, you know, quite often is that it's a product of India's bureaucratic hierarchy uh, in that you know, everybody who is, who is in the foreign service wants to someday retire as ambassador or deputy ambassador. And if you have a large foreign service, that's not possible because you can only have so many people becoming ambassadors someday. And so what happens is that there's an incredible filtering effort that goes in at the entry point itself, where you've got millions and millions of people trying to write this entrance exam. And at the end of it, you have 30, 35 people being recruited each year into the foreign service. And then, you know, at some point, they're kind of, uh, uh, I think, uh, practically guaranteed that at the time of their retirement, they will become, you know, undersecretaries or uh, ambassadors or deputy ambassadors uh, someday. Uh, and so this, I think, in, in, in some ways uh, is one argument that's made people say that the bureaucracy doesn't want to expand itself uh, 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 because it would lose its privileges and it would become less elitist in some sense. The other reason I think that that is, that is kind of, um, you know, thrown around a, a bit is that the exam structure, the exam system itself is not uh, adapted to recruiting a large enough foreign service. Uh, India uses a generalist exam system. And so everybody who wants to be a railway officer or a police officer or a tax collector uh, or, a, or a diplomat or anything else in the Indian government needs to write this one single generalist exam. Uh, and then at the end of it, uh, uh, you know, you are ranked based on your uh, performance in, the, in that exam. And then uh, people who are ranked higher up will get the service of their choice or preference, whereas people who are ranked further down uh, get uh, you know, the, the service that is not of their preference. And so for several years, what was happening was that people who are ranked higher up, they wanted to be in the administrative service, the domestic administrative service, because that was seen as a more powerful and prestigious position. Uh, you know, you, you do get to have, I do remember very distinctly, this very interesting conversation with uh, a diplomat at the UN, an Indian diplomat at the UN, uh, who is today one of India's ambassadors in Africa. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, we were walking together from the permanent mission of India uh, to the UN uh, secretariat and, and headquarters. Uh, it's only about two or three blocks away and so very walkable and, uh, uh, you know, uh, through the traffic of, of uh, you know, downtown, midtown Manhattan. Uh, and while we were walking, you know, this diplomat, I, I, I happened to ask him because at that point in time, I was doing research for my book and I asked him, okay, what do you think is, is, is the difference between the IAS, which is the Indian Administrative Service, 
and the Indian Foreign Service. And he said, you know, look at us. We are walking here. We're all suited and booted and we are walking to work. Whereas a guy, my colleague who is, you know, in the IAS, we passed in the, in the same exam, the same batch. We went to school together and he's now got a, a car and, you know, he's got servants around him. He's got a personal chauffeur and he gets driven all around town wherever he wants to go to the various villages, etc. People treat him like a king, whereas we are walking to work. So he says that, you know, in, in some sense, people want to join the IAS. They don't want to join the foreign service uh, because, you know, it, it, they tend to suffer kind of... Uh, well, not suffer, but, you know, tend to enjoy fewer privileges on the ground wherever they are working since, the, you know, they are one of several other diplomats uh, in that country. And so as a result, you found that a lot of higher ranking people actually for many years, not, not currently, uh, but, but for many years, were actually going into the IAS and not into the Foreign Service. And the Foreign Service ended up, uh, you know, picking from a smaller talent pool, if you will. Uh, which which reflects to this day. So the whole system, in my opinion, needs an overhaul. I don't see really why a guy who wants to be a diplomat uh, to the, for the Indian government should be answering questions on wildlife sanctuaries and sculptures and uh, you know that sort of stuff, rather than questions on Ukraine and Russia and uh, you know what foreign policy stand should India take on Palestine or Iran. Uh, these are the questions that diplomats should be judged on and their aptitude should be judged on. Uh, but the current generalist exam structure that India has uh, does not allow for that sort of aptitude testing and, uh, and that kind of evaluation uh, uh, of, uh, of Indian diplomatic recruits. So I think the entire system really, to be honest, is outdated and, and deserves to have an overhaul. And there are several ways to do this. I've written extensively about it in, in uh, uh, various newspapers over the years. Uh, there are many ways in which India can uh, recruit its diplomats uh, properly and suitably and, uh, and, and you know, expand its foreign service. We have a question from Stuart. How does India, Indian, uh, excuse me, how does India project cultural power, e.g. through the Nehru um, Institute, language, film, etc.? For example, um, the Confucius Institute, Goethe Institute, British Council, and so on. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, India does not do this. India should be doing it. It's actually an argument that's being made now in India uh, by many people. Of course, now the question is, you know, do you do you kind of uh, uh, showcase uh, diversity and secularism or do you showcase majoritarianism and the other stuff? Uh, but uh, India does not do this. India, India has never done this. Uh, traditionally, as, as I was talking about the diaspora and India's soft power around the world, a lot of it has been very organic. Uh, it has been uh, bottom up and it's always been that way. I mean, in my book, I talk about uh, uh, the, uh, the Chola kings of South India who managed to enjoy influence in Southeast Asia, uh, well far away from the Indian subcontinent. And the way that that happened was because merchants and uh, you know sages and saints and all of these other people were actually going to Southeast Asia from India and they took their culture with them and over a period of time built up that sort of uh, cultural influence bottom up. And then, uh, you know, at the end of it, actually there, there, there ended up Indian kings in, in uh, Southeast Asia. And then, you know, they linked back to the Chola kingdom in, in India. And then the Chola kingdom in some sense became really the only uh, Indian uh, kingdom or Indian empire in history to enjoy uh, sovereignty or, or uh, 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 you, you know, influence uh, outside of the Indian subcontinent. So India's uh, soft power in many ways has always been kind of bottom up. It's never been top down in nature. Uh, and, and, and I don't think that's particularly a bad thing. I think in many ways, uh, cultural influence works better when, you know, um, track two diplomacy happens or civil society happens. Uh, I think it works better when Indian students go abroad and showcase Indian culture or, uh, uh, you know, uh, when Indian uh, singers and Bollywood superstars go abroad, uh, I think that that way of that that method of building soft power appeal, uh, I feel like it, it's it's a bit more impactful and effective than the government doing it. And and you know, the the case of the Confucius Institutes uh, is one reason why. I mean, you you look at what's happening now with Confucius uh, Institutes, you find a lot of countries uh, around the world, particularly in the West. 
have started becoming somewhat uh, suspicious of them. And, and, and some of the uh, uh, universities, uh, particularly in the US, have started closing down uh, Confucius Institutes uh, on, on their campuses as well, because they think that it's a platform for propaganda of, of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, and so I think in, in, in some ways, bottom-up propaganda, if you will, works better than top-down uh, imposition of, of soft power and, and, and culture. Uh, and, and, and maybe, uh, you know, that, that, that's just worked better for India over the years. Thank you. And we have a final question from Abhishek. Would you think that the socio-political discourse today in India, whether around domestic or foreign policy, leans far too much on technology, using it to scaffold its ambivalence? Can you repeat that question? That's a, that's a complicated question. <laughs> Would you think that the socio-political discourse today in India, whether around domestic or foreign policy, leans far too much on technology, using it to scaffold its ambivalence? I'm, I'm guessing that by technology, uh, you mean social media, uh, given that India is, is, a, is a large uh, country and very active and vocal on social media. Anybody who tweets about India, uh, would would learn that India has a very large presence on Twitter, uh, and so you know it's it's very common to find uh, uh, Indians with thousands and thousands of followers. You will not find that as 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 much as common uh, in the West. Uh, that that that's that's the uh, uh, observation that I've made on Twitter. Uh, but uh, you know this is a very new phenomenon. It's it's really only the Modi government that's kind of taken to social media and used it as a platform for. Uh, I want to say propaganda, but maybe I'll go with public diplomacy. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a culture that I think is, is still very new. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's unfortunately very partisan uh, in nature as well. And so what you find on social media or through the use of technology and so on is more a BJP foreign policy than an Indian foreign policy. Uh, you, you will find, for instance, very vocal vociferous support today for uh, Vladimir Putin uh, and, and, and for the invasion of Ukraine on right-wing Indian Twitter. You will not find that in Indian foreign policy discourse. So on Indian Twitter, it's very dangerous to criticize Putin, even though India uh, as a country on the world stage follows a foreign policy of ambivalence. Uh, there's very, very limited ambivalence on, on Indian social media. Uh, Indian tweet, uh, twi uh, Twitter users always have a, an opinion on anything and everything. Uh, and, and there is a network, it's, it's been fairly well documented and proven that there is a network linked to the Indian ruling party, the BJP, that is very, very vocal and active on social media uh, and, and tends to, you know, sort of play up certain things uh, and underplay certain other things. Uh, even if Indian policy or foreign policy is, is going in a, you know, is, is, is not taking that route. So what you find on social media, I think in some sense is a, is a quote unquote unofficial foreign policy where uh, you know, uh, accounts that are linked to the BJP and, and its uh, uh, IT cell uh, tend to take uh, very vocal positions on certain things uh, that, uh, that the Indian government does not uh, feel comfortable uh, talking about, or you know, that the Indian government does not feel comfortable taking an institutional position on. Uh, and, and, and so it, it leads to this, this undercurrent of a, an unofficial foreign policy, I think, in some sense, which I, I think is, is quite rightly uh, termed as, uh, as a scaffolding uh, of, of Indian uh, foreign policy and, and, and politics. Thank you. Mohammed Zishan, I'd like to thank you for showing more on the performance of India's foreign policy, the challenges and your hopes for the future. I would like to thank our attendees for joining us today. We really do look forward to finding out more on this topic from your book. Where can we find out more about you and your book? Oh, you can order it anywhere in the world. Uh, in India, it is available in, in every bookstore. Uh, there is an international edition in the works, uh, but I don't have a clear date on when uh, or, or even if, if, if it will be available soon. Uh, but you can still order the edition that's, that's already available uh, anywhere in the world through Amazon uh, UK or Amazon.com or, or anywhere else. Uh, and I do look forward to, uh, to hearing your thoughts and reviews on, uh, on social media and on Amazon and wherever else uh, you're able to post about it.
Wonderful. Once again, Mohammed Zishan, thank you so much. Thank you to the attendees for joining us today. I wish everyone a wonderful evening. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Goodbye.